<laughs> it's official. <laughs> um, hello, my friends on Zoom, and hello, my friends here in person. My name is Tina Bruce. I'm the program coordinator here at the Sir Public Library. It's a real pleasure to be here with you in person and on Zoom. Hello, uh, for this conversation with Claire Goss. Uh, before we go any further, I would like to express my gratitude that we're able to gather on the shared unceded territories of the Luwak people, known in their nation in their language as Luwaul, and of the Squamish people, known in their language as Squamish. We are so lucky to be on these territories, and I'm particularly delighted that we can be here in person. I can see all your faces. It's very exciting. Um, in terms of housekeeping, there's not much. Um, if you're in the room, the washrooms are right behind us. Um, the library is closed now, so I'll ask you not to wander out in that direction, but you can access the washrooms through there. Um, phones on silent. I guess we have to start saying that again. <laughs> um, yeah, phones on some, some polite setting. Um, you're welcome to take notes on your phone if that's the kind of person you are, but you're also going to receive this recording, so sit back and relax, I guess. Um, Zoom people, your housekeeping is that we'll ask you to stay muted um, through Claire's talk, but you will have a chance to ask questions at the end. Uh, if you want to ask them through the chat, you can type type them in the chat and I will make sure that Claire sees them and I will read them out so everybody knows what they are. Ooh, that's about it. Don't forget to plug it in. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> you should win it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I guess we'll get started. Where's my cake? Yeah. Everybody can watch you do this. <laughs> okay, now we can start. Okay, okay, so we'll get started. So um, I'm Claire. I've been a landscaper in Whistler for the last 12, 13 years. Um, I work down at the Brew Creek Center, which has about 12 acres of beautiful landscape grounds, um, as well as I, have, I do the Nickel Stop Golf Course here in Whistler, as well as a few other bits and pieces around town. So. I'm pretty familiar with landscaping in this climate, and I know that gardening in Whistler can sometimes be really challenging. We do have a really challenging climate. So um, looking through regular garden magazines and things like that, a lot of that information doesn't apply to us here. We are a lot more limited with some of the plants that we can grow, but it doesn't mean that we can't grow lots of really beautiful, wonderful things. So um, now that it's springtime, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some like basic garden chores that we should do in the spring to set our gardens up for success in the summer. And uh, so I'm going to go through kind of the list of things that um, I like to do to get gardening ready for the spring. Then I'm going to move into um, a bunch of different plants that for me are definitely tried and true and really successful whistle growing plants with a focus on flowering plants because um, I really like flowers and it's really nice to have a nice colorful garden and attract all the pollinators and things like that and to even have a cutting garden for your own personal use is really nice. Um, I also try and always landscape with more of a permaculture attitude so I do fully organic practices I wouldn't use any synthetic fertilizers um, I try and with, with permaculture it means you're sort of working more with the natural ecology of our environment a lot of modern day landscaping processes really work against the natural processes. So, you know, breaking up all the leaves to bare soil and then putting down synthetic fertilizers to replace the nutrition, things like that, that's really kind of commonplace. Um, I'm really trying to bring things more back to more natural, sustainable and environmentally responsible way of landscaping. Um, so now that it's spring and a lot of the snow is melting, you might notice that uh, little things are starting to come from the garden. And it can be really, really tempting to get out there as soon as possible and start clearing things up. And, um, you know, the first kind of nice sunny day, we get like really motivated and we want to do it. I like to say kind of just hold on a little bit longer. Um, it's almost better to wait for your garden until the overnight temperatures are kind of steadily around seven degrees, which for us is still a little bit of a ways away. And the reason for that is that over winter, there are so many beneficial insects and bugs and things living in all the dead fall that fell in the gardens in the fall. So a lot of, um, uh, whether it's like microbes or even caterpillars, but like little things that are either hibernating or have laid their eggs in the fall. If we start clearing up all the debris that's on the ground now, we're gonna be clearing up a whole bunch of those really beneficial insects and taking away from the complex ecology of our gardens. So it's really nice to do them a favor and just leave them in place a little bit longer. Um, if you do have some really early plants starting to shoot up, absolutely go ahead and clear around those, any kind of bulk areas. 
I like to wait a little longer. It's also serving as a really nice mulch for some of the other things that are taking a little bit longer to wake up. Also, it has been fairly wet this spring and uh, when the ground is still really wet, it's really not good for us to be walking all over the soil when it's wet and soupy. It really compacts the soil, which isn't healthy. Soil needs to have oxygen in it. So it's also a great idea to break to it to dry out a little bit or even try and avoid to do your gardening on the really, really wet, soggy days. Wait for a sunny day where you're not smooshing the soil quite so much. Now, when it comes time to start raking everything up, I say be really, really gentle. It can be really tempting to get a rake and just get in there and start cleaning out all that debris and all that mess. Go, go lightly. I like to rake lightly. There's so many like little things coming up and they're so delicate at this time of year. I'm going to be really gentle and loving as we're kind of going over the, the nice little plants. Um, and it's, I find it's nice to not rake up every single little leaf debris pine needle that's on the garden. Their absolute bare surface soil isn't conducive to healthy soil. So like I was saying before, a lot of modern day practices have really gone against the natural ecology of, of, of gardening and maintaining a um, really healthy ecosystem within the garden. You know, I, I used to do it as well before I kind of, you know, started to understand a bit more of an environmentally friendly way. So instead of breaking all the leaves out from underneath the shrub, you know, I used to like lift up branches, break everything out and lift it down, lift it down so it looks really clean leave all the leaves under there. In a few weeks time, that shrub's gonna leaf out, it's gonna hide it all anyway. And all that organic matter is just gonna break down and help enrich your soil. So sometimes you might think, oh, it looks a little bit messy, but as the plants start to grow in and fill in, you're gonna notice it less and less, and it's gonna break down more and more. Um, it's like natural compost, um, which is always really beneficial. Um, talking about leaves and breaking things up, if you left all your leaves and dead fall in place in the fall, that's great. A lot of people rake all their leaves up in the fall because it looks tidier and it's easier to deal with in the spring. Um, I, I like to try and leave some stuff if I can. And if you have left things in place, a really great idea is if you're raking up all your leaves, rather than just throwing them out into the dump or taking them to the composter for dump, if you have space, rake it all into garbage bags. And not, not if it's twigs and gravel and rocks, but if it's straight up leaves, um, I like to do this thing, it's called leaf mold. If you've heard of leaf mold, it's, it's a really basic way of composting. And um, regular compost is, works with heat and microorganisms that break things down. It's a very active process. Leaf mold is, it's a different thing. It's a fungal, uh, fungal process where fungus in the leaves breaks leaves down a bit more slowly. So if you put a whole garbage bag full of leaves, if you put them in the back of the garage or the side of the house or just somewhere, if you leave them there in fall, when it comes time to mulching your garden in the fall, this is gonna have turned into leaf mold and will have all of natural decomposed. It's so like a chunky soil, and it's one of the most nutrient dense things that you can put in your garden. The microbes love it, and it, it's free. So it's good for us, it's good for the environment. It's a really basic thing that can really improve the health of the soil. And for growing any plants, the, the soil and the life that's happening within the soil is really the basis and the foundation of having a healthy plant. Unless we're investing um, time and thought into our soil quality, the plants won't thrive um, without that. So that's that. Um, also the springtime is a great time to assess any damage from the winter. And I don't know about you guys, but this, is, uh, this spring I'm seeing the most damage in my ornamental trees and shrubs than I have in any other year living in Whistler. The crazy snowfall we had and the weather we had, I've broken things all over the place. Um, now's the time to, in a few weeks time, is to start and getting in there and cleaning all that stuff out. So when it comes to pruning anything woody, so shrubs or trees, but the principle is like 3D, so dead, damaged or diseased. So any parts of the shrub that or tree that are broken, have died off during the winter or look like they are diseased, just cut them out. Sharp pruners are a saw. Get rid of all the crappy stuff first, then you can kind of look at it structurally and shape it a little more. But you'll often find sometimes with some larger limbs or more structural components that have been broken, once you pull them out, it's gonna change, change the, the structure of the actual shrub or tree now. So you might think differently about how you're going to shape it. Um, next up after that is once kind of things are clean, um, I, every spring, it's a really good idea to top dress with compost. So you don't need a lot of compost, um, depending on how big your yard is and how much exposed soil you have. I think it's a really great idea to cover everything with about an inch to two inches of natural compost. And you can buy that at, um, you can buy it in 
like plastic bags from big box stores from their garden centers. But I mean, High Country on Mons Road and the garden center down in Function, they also sell it in bulk. And you can go down there with like a big rubber made container in the back of your car or a couple of buckets and you can buy it by the bucket. And you generally don't need very much. A lot of um, residential houses that I've worked on in Whistler, I just maybe take 10 or 15 white buckets full and you might even need a lot less than that if you don't have a big garden. It's just a really nice idea to put the compost down it puts natural um, nutrients back into the soil without having to use fertilizers. Um, I, do, I do also use organic fertilizers. Um, organic fertilizers tend to be very, very gentle. Mm -hmm. uh, so the nice thing about that is you're never going to burn or harm your plants. A lot of synthetic fertilizers that you buy from the box stores, um, if you misuse them, you can harm your plants and you can also harm all the living organisms in the soil. Um, so there's a brand called Gaia, which I actually, I bought some here, so it's up to the, the Zoom people. But this logo here that you see, this guy agree, yeah, you can buy this um, at High Country as well as the Function Garden Centre. They have a bunch of different products and it is the best um, natural fertilizer that I've ever used. I have a couple of different products depending on what you're fertilizing, but it's really, really gentle. It's really easy to use. It's um, just a really fine dust powder that you would sprinkle on the soil and then work it in a little bit with a rake. Um, and it really, if you've had, if you haven't, um, Composted your soil for very many years, or if you have some fairly um, uh, like just unenthusiastic soil that's not really doing a whole lot, this is something that you can incorporate and it's really going to help. Another thing that's really, really great is worm castings. Um, so you can buy worm castings from stores, or even people um, often will have their own like little home worm farm kits. That's like worth its weight in gold. Worm castings is probably about one of the best things you can put into your garden. Okay, so also in the springtime, um, what else have we got? Oh, any time you start to see weeds coming up, um, if you start seeing weeds coming up, so I've already got weeds coming up in my garden. There's, there's still snow, but I also still have weeds. It's a great time to start pulling weeds. A lot of people see weeding as more of a summer chore. Get them now while they're small and they haven't spread. Uh, you will thank yourself in the summer for getting on top of it now. Sometimes I see those little weeds and right now I just keep walking past them because I feel like I have bigger and more important things I need to do in the garden. And I need to remind myself to stop picking out. It's um, definitely kind of more important. So um, I had a question that came through around um, irrigation and whether drip irrigation versus overhead irrigation and if there's one that's better than the other. So they both have their positives and negatives. So, also, too, if you don't have irrigation in your garden or you're thinking about installing it, spring is definitely a really great time because if you're having to dig trenches and things like that, do it before your plants start growing and get bigger. Um, I use a combination of drip as well as overhead. So overhead irrigations are the sprinklers that come up and like spray water everywhere. They're, they're a faster way to irrigate, um, but sometimes having all that damp moisture on top of leaves can um, lead to pests and disease if it stays damp for too long. Whereas drip irrigation is like tape that lays flat on the ground and waters directly into the soil. So you, um, you don't get a lot of like mold issues like that, that sometimes you do with um, overhead. Uh, drip irrigation, I do it in um, like vegetable beds and things that are a little bit more like farm-like gardens. And I use overhead for all the landscape um, aesthetic gardens. And the main reason is, is the drip tape just doesn't look aesthetic going through the ground everywhere and it's less effective at reaching things far and wide so combination of both they both have the pros and cons uh, but if you don't have irrigation you don't necessarily need it you can always set up a sprinkler on a timer with a garden hose and just have to move that around every couple of days when you're um wanting to water different areas and my only real tip with watering is try and do all your watering in the morning rather than the evening so when you water and you saturate everything in the day in the morning, it has a whole day for that water to kind of burn off and evaporate evaporate off the foliage so that it's not sitting stagnant in the evening time when it cools down. That's kind of where like a lot of pests like to get in and nuzzle into the warm, damp plants at nighttime. If you water in the evening, it kind of stays wet and soggy all night. So try and water in the morning if you can. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt you. Sure. Second. People on Zoom want to see more of you. Oh. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> little owl. <laughs> um, and do I need to press a button to get this off the screen? Oh yes, just uh, got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay, nice. Thank you. Um, okay, so 
Uh, also, this is uh, spring is a really great time to, if you're thinking of adding new plants to your garden or moving plants around your garden, now is the time to do it. In the summer heat, it's really not a great time for planting or moving things. So springtime is a great time to reassess, move things, dig holes, replant. And if you have any perennials that you want to divide that maybe you didn't get time to divide last year in the fall, it's a really great time to do it in the spring. So um, if you have like a big clump of perennials and you want to turn it into more plants, Stick it up with a sharp shovel, cut in half, and then you've got more plants to plant around the garden. And just a little note on um, perennials and digging and things like that. I often get asked, I've lost some of my tools in to show you guys. It's kind of a funny thing, but this little shovel here, which I don't know if people can see it, it's a really small little square sharp shovel. This is probably one of my most used garden tools. It's, uh, it's a really small blade, so if you're digging holes in the garden, you're not going to be disturbing too many other plants with. Um, a big shovel and it's really straight and upright. So when I say like you're digging perennials, I usually dig a hole and I literally just like stab it. Like I use it as a knife to cut things in half. I use this thing all the time. And then earlier before when we were talking about raking, this is um, a shrub break that I use. So you'll see that it's a fairly small, has a super long handle, it's really lightweight. And it's really, really great for getting in and around plants. And a lot of people I see will go into the garden with these big fan rakes that are excellent for raking leaves off your lawn. But if you're actually working in a garden bed around plants, something like this is gonna be a lot more accurate, a lot more maneuverable. It's got really like way more flexible tines than a normal lawn rake would have as well. So um, just a show and tell of my favorite little tools there. Claire, while you're standing, can you show the um, fertilizer one more time? Oh, yeah. So this is the the Gaia Green. So the brand is just Gaia. They have a bunch of different products, okay. and um, yeah, perfect. yeah. So anything with this like kind of green logo here is um, really good stuff, and it's totally organic, which is what we're always trying to strive for. Okay, so. Um, that is kind of mostly a rundown of like all the chores I would do. And now I'm going to move into talking about um, some plants. So I think with a, a garden bed, it's really nice to have something in your garden that's kind of blooming all the way from early spring all the way to the end of fall. So it's nice to have a selection of different plants. So you have like early spring bloomers, spring, summer, late summer and fall bloomers. So it's nice to have something of feature at all times in your garden. So when you walk past, there's always something in bloom. So um, we'll start talking about some plants. Okay. So this is a picture of hellebores and our question actually came in about hellebores. So hellebores are little clump forming perennial. They are one of the earliest things to flower. The photo with the snow, I took that photo yesterday. So that's my, the hellebore that I have at Brew Creek right now is blooming through the snow. So they are one of the first things in the garden to bloom, they are incredibly hardy. So um, someone asked a question if they're suitable to grow in Whistler. Absolutely, they're really, really tough. Uh, the purple one is one that, uh, that was a photo taken from last year. It's blooming in the middle of some bleeding heart foliage. So they come up very, very early in the spring. Their leaves stay green under the snow all winter. Uh, they don't like the heat. So they're gonna come up in the spring. As soon as it starts to warm off, some of the foliage and flowers are gonna die back. And the clump might almost disappear over the summer. And then in the fall, it's gonna sp like sprout up more leaves again when it cools down in the fall. And sometimes you get flowers again in the fall. You definitely get flowers in the spring, sometimes in the fall, but they do go dormant in the summer. Now, hellebores have really taken off over the last year or two in terms of fashion and floral design. Um, you're seeing hellebores more and more. Yeah, you see, yeah. <laughs> she works at Zenko. She's, she's got a finger on the pulse with all the, the trendy flowers. <laughs> so they um, they are definitely becoming more and more popular. One of the, the not so hot things with hellebores is they're always on short stems. So um, if you are growing them for cut flower purposes, just know that they are short stems. So not always the best to work for with floral arranging, but in the landscape, they are absolutely beautiful, very hardy. And it's cut flower. They last forever in a vase as well, which is really, really nice. Claire, can I hear you one more time? Sure. Sorry, it's for the people in the room. Can we like a light off? Is that easier to see the, yeah. the yeah. engine? Yeah. yeah. Is that everybody good with that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Okay, so that's hellebores. So whoever asked the question about can you grow hellebores in Whistler? Absolutely yes, they are very easy. I have about three or four of them in the gardens at Brew Creek right now. And in the fall, I just ordered 45 more of them that I'm gonna be planting this spring so I can actually have a whole garden bed just of hellebores because they are super fashionable right now and there's a demand for them. 
Okay, so the next one is our spring flowering bulb. So um, one of the other really early things to come up with small little crocuses and snowdrops that we're seeing around town are the spring bulbs. We have daffodils and tulips and hyacinths. So these are bulbs that you plant in the fall and then they come up in the spring. They usually come up in the spring before a lot of the perennials have fully woken up. So it's a really nice uh, way to fill a void to get in the spring when not much else is going on. Now I have, these are also ones that I have uh, at Brew Creek last spring. The one on the far left is a really fancy daffodil and then we have a fancy tulip and another cool tulip and I just want to show you some of the cool varieties because people often think of daffodils a bright yellow trumpet flower but daffodils actually come in so many colors and forms and all these kind of pretty more frilly apricot colored ones are um, becoming pretty fashionable right now, which is really nice. Then in the middle, we have the, the ruffled uh, tulip, which doesn't look anything like a traditional tulip, but uh, and they come in so many different colors and forms and then some other tulips on the side. And there was a question that came in about somebody asking about whether you need to dig up your tulip bulbs um, after they're flowered or not. Now, so with, with daffodils, I tend to leave daffodils in the ground. They tend to perennialize a little bit better. So long as you don't cut the flowers, if you just leave them in the foliage size back, they'll perennialize. Tulips, um, old fashioned, really kind of standard tulips do perennialize fairly well. All the new kind of hybridized ones that have the really big showy flowers, I tend to treat them as an annual. If you have a whole garden bed of them, you can absolutely leave them. Uh, if you're leaving any of the bulbs to try and perennialize them, just try to let the foliage completely die back. So once the, once the flower's faded, leave it in place and wait till the foliage has fully turned brown and started to disintegrate before you, um, before you cut them down. Um, but uh, the other thing to keep in mind, like a lot of people will plant tulips and bulbs in the front of their garden bed so they get the most attention and show during spring. If you're wanting to leave them in place, just uh, don't accidentally dig a hole and plant something else in them so you might um, disturb them. Uh, a nice little trick that I've done before in the past that works really well is when you're planting your bulbs in the fall, if you have perennials and you want to plant all your perennials and bulbs together, you can actually dig your perennial up. So if you have like a daylily or something like that, you can actually dig your daylily up, put the bulbs in the hole and then put the daylily back on top of it and replant it. And what's going to happen is in the spring, those bulbs are going to go right through that daylily. It's not going to harm it. Daylilies are really, really tough. And so in the spring, you're going to get these beautiful bulbs that come up. They're going to die back as the daylily. So you're using the same piece of space for two separate plants. And the bulbs are so strong that it's going to go straight through that root ball of the existing plant, which is pretty cool. So here we have some peonies and then some bleeding hearts. So peonies are a lot of people's favorite. They're a really, really hard, hardy perennial. They can take some really, really cold temperatures. So in Whistler, we, we consider our climate zone a zone five. So um, there are zones, I think, five to zero across the world, depending on your, your weather. We're a zone five. So if you're ever looking for plants at the garden center, look for things that are um, comfortable growing in a zone five. I think peonies go all the way down to a zone four. So they're nice um, clump forming perennials. These also will bloom kind of like later on in the spring. Uh, they're a favorite. And then the other one on the other side, there is the bleeding hearts or dicentra. They're actually native, which is really nice. I think it's always great to use as many native plants as you can in your garden. And if something's native to the area, it should thrive in our situations and these done. And with both of these guys, after they're flowered, they do tend to die back. So you have this beautiful foliage and flowers that come up. Neither one of these plants are comfortable with summer heat. So I will often plant these with other things around them. So once the peonies and bleeding hearts start dying back, then there's other more late summer things that are coming up and taking their place. Um, but I think they're both lovely and they both work really well as cut flowers too. Next up, this is something called fritillaria, and fritillaria are also native, which is really cool. And both of these plants are just two different types of fritillaria, so they look completely different. Uh, they, they're grown from bulbs, but they are um, native. So the one on the left is sometimes people call it a, a snake's head lily. Some people also call it a checkerboard lily. Um, they're really small, dainty. You can sometimes find them in the forest. If you're lucky, they bloom up in a few places. And the other one is the Imperialis fritillaria. And the one with the white flowers, I want to say that's about three and a half feet tall when that one flowers. And they're fairly majestic. And again, they come up usually once the, the tulips and daffodils have kind of died back. These are 
kind of something else that can grow up and take their place. And with the toll of fritillary being around three feet tall, they're really quite striking in a late spring garden when a lot of the other perennials really haven't even um, started to get going yet. And native too, which is great. Uh, so this is uh, Bronnera, sometimes called Jack Frost. So this is a shade loving uh, low lying ground cover perennial. So the photo on the left has uh, the pink, the very late season pink tulips growing through it. So how I was mentioning before that you can actually dig up a perennial, put bulbs and then the bulbs will grow through it. So these pink uh, tulips, they're some of the last flowering tulips I have. And they're kind of at the end of their lifespan in this photo. But as you can see, those tulips are about to fall apart and the banaria is just starting to flower. So the photo of the blue flowers is probably taken a week or two after the first photo as opposed to the flowers. And it has this beautiful silvery foliage, does really well in um, shady conditions, which I know a lot of people whistling our tight belly have really shady conditions to deal with. So this is definitely a favorite. The blue flowers don't last very well in a vase, but they last a long time in the plant in the garden, which is really nice. Um, so we have some hostas and some Solomon steel. So hostas are another shade garden staple, really, really hardy. So pretty much all the plants that I'm showing you are ones that um, I think are in a way fairly like foolproof. Like they're, they absolutely will withstand all of our harshest uh, winters. They um, Sometimes with the, the summer's getting a little bit hotter, we might need to put a bit more water on them. But generally speaking, they're all pretty strong, nice, hardy, um, perennials. That means they're going to come back every year and you're always replanting them. The Solomon seal on the side with those little white bells, they, um, they're like a kind of late spring, early summer flower. They're clump forming. So, and they're also native as well. Um, they're beautiful, graceful, like arching stems. They do well in shade and sun. They're fully, um, can do shade and sun, very, very compatible with either. They do just like their roots to be a little bit more on the moist side. Um, and same thing with the hostas. So there are so many different varieties of hostas and sometimes they get a bad rap of being boring, but they come in so many different colors. There's bright yellow hostas, there's blue hostas and everything in between. And there are hostas that are bred to be specifically for deep shade. And there are other hostas that can handle full sun. So depending on what you, your needs in your garden are, there's a hosta that can fill the space. Uh, next up here, we have daylilies, also called hemerocalias. Now, I've chosen a couple of, I think, more special types of daylilies. You'll see daylilies, they're a staple in Whistler. I think nearly every house I've ever worked on has had daylilies, but they're usually always yellow. So when you think of a daylily, they usually always have these really bright yellow flowers, which is still really pretty. Just wanted to show you guys that there are so many other varieties of daylilies that have all different kind of colors and textures to their flowers. Now, we're kind of moving into more... I would say these are definitely like a late spring, early summer. Um, they have these beautiful kind of grassy clumps. And the nice thing about daylilies is I'd say that they're fairly unkillable. Um, they can absolutely take a beating. Um, these guys are probably one of the most hardiest plants that I've ever worked with. And, they, and they, they're beautiful as well. So uh, daylilies people sometimes I think take them for granted because you see them everywhere. I just wanted to show that there's, you know, special fancy varieties that are available at garden centers. Um, so what's next? Okay, next up, so this is more kind of late spring, early summer. These are Asiatic lilies. So there's a couple of different families of lilies that um, behave differently and flower at different times. So the Asiatic lilies, these are gonna be the first lilies that flower in the garden. So Asiatic lilies, they're not scented. They don't have a scent like um, Oriental lilies have, and they're usually much shorter. So Asiatic lilies um, are really kind of two, two and a half feet tall. They are definitely smaller. Asiatic lilies can also grow in part shade. They prefer full sun, but they'll absolutely thrive in part shade as well. Um, the ones in the middle, there's a, the green grass that they're growing through. This is a Japanese grass called Heikon grass, and that's a full shade grass. And a full shade grass to have um, this beautiful, bright lime yellow green color can really help brighten up a shady spot. I know there was um, a question that um, uh, someone had asked about shade, um, shade ground covers. So whenever I see a shade ground cover, I'll, I'll point it out. So these Asiatic lilies come in nearly every kind of color imaginable. 
Um, and again, really, really cold hardy and they make an excellent cut flower as well. The only thing with the lilies to watch out for with the cut flower is the pollen on the stamen. So you can see with the really dark lilies on the side, there's the orange um, uh, stamen. So that pollen can, can stain you. So if, you, it's, um, if you've got a tablecloth or something, so you just re remove those pollens if they're, um, they're coming out. The ones in the middle, they're a pollenless variety. So you can get pollenless varieties. If you plan on growing them for cut flowers, I would recommend trying to find the ones without pollen. And there, there are so many different varieties. We have a comment that they're toxic to pets. Oh, okay. Okay, don't okay. feed them to your pets. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is a late spring flowering anemone. There's a couple of different families of anemones. These grow from little corms, so you can either plant the corms in the fall or in the spring. Um, they produce like a little tuft of greener in the bottom and then these beautiful flowers come out. They come in about every single color imaginative and anemones have also been really, really fashionable over the last couple of years. They have nice, strong, straight stems. Um, they last forever in a vase when you cut them, and they're also a delight in the garden. Um, again, they prefer cool weather, so they're much more active and they flower in the spring. As soon as there's summer heat, they tend to die back, um, and then in the fall, they might produce some more um, greenery again in the fall. But they, they are perennial here, and I just think they're really lovely. So that's the anemone. Um, so now I'm moving into some more summer blooms. So on the left, we have the big giant alliums, which grow from a big bulb. And these guys are fully perennial. So the first year you plant them, you might get the biggest flowers. And then over subsequent years, the flowers will reduce, but you'll get more. So the, the clump, like this, um, this clump would have started off as maybe two or three bulbs a couple of years ago. Um, but now there's like more and more stems coming up. The nice thing about these alliums is that they hold their flowers for a really long time in the garden. And even after the flower has faded, it leaves this beautiful seed head. So you get this big, beautiful round seed head, which is also a really nice interest in the garden. Also the pollinators love this, like butterflies and bees just flock to these. So they're, they're really nice to have. And then on the other side here, we have an iris. Um, irises are really strong and really hardy as well. Uh, I think I, the reason I put up this iris is because lots of people have irises here, but everyone has these kind of plain Jane common purple irises. And when, I think when most people think of an iris, I think of these little small purple ones. They're still beautiful, but there are so many other beautiful, really fancy varieties out there. Um, bearded iris as well, they're becoming more and more popular. Um, as a cut flower, they don't last that long in a vase, but uh, in the garden, they last a little longer. And they're just, they're, they're striking and they're delicate. And, and they come in so many beautiful colors and roughly textures and um, they're just a delight. And they're a really strong plant too, which is, which is great. Um, again, for our summer blooms, this is Astranthia. And I definitely talked about Astranthia in one of my other previous gardening talks. Um, it really only comes in purple or white, I've shown both. This is a perennial. Now this takes full sun um, to shade, not full deep shade, but part shade to full sun. Very adaptable. The only thing with Astranthia, it prefers to be a little bit on the damp side. It does self seed itself freely. So if you're wanting to welcome more things into your garden, Astranthia is a really great choice. They hold their flowers forever. So once it flowers, the flowers dry naturally on the plant. So you can have these purple flowers from when it flowers in June. They'll still be there in September if you don't cut them off. They darken in color a little bit, but they still stay there. So they're a really nice, long lasting flower to have. These, these are one of my favorites. Astranthia is definitely a secret weapon that is less secret because I keep telling everyone about them. <laughs> um, okay, so on the left here we have a stilby. Sorry, these photos are a little a little smush. So a stilby is another really, really cold hardy whistler friendly perennial. They come in all different flowers, like the colors come in all different flowers coming all different colors. Um, and they hold their flowers on the plant for a really long time as well, which is really nice. Um, there are so many plants out there that flower and the flower opens up and lasts two or three days and then they're gone. Um, I think it's nice to put things in the garden where the flowers are gonna last for several weeks, sometimes even months. And a stilby is a really, really good one for that. They can handle not quite full sun, but partial sun to fairly shady. Um, they do like to have their roots a little bit damp. So a little extra watering or if you have like a soggy or boggy areas in your garden, they do well there. Not so great in a very dry landscape. Um, so the next one over is Nepeta. And Nepeta is pretty common. Um, I love it because again, it's unkillable. I would say Nepeta and daylilies 
uh, the two plants that can take probably the most abuse um, and still come out shiny. And uh, Nepeta is really great. If um, I often get asked about lavender, that people always really like to grow lavender. Lavender is a little bit of a challenge in our Whistler climate. If you have a really nice, sunny, dry spot, lavender can do well, but a lot of people, it doesn't really tend to overwinter here very well. Now, Nepeta, it doesn't smell like lavender at all, but it has a very similar aesthetic to it. Um, and the nice thing too with the Nepeta, you can often get two, sometimes three flushes of flowers out of them. Um, so when it flowers in the early summer, if you cut all the blooms off, then maybe a month or so later, you'll get more. If you keep cutting them off, you can get up to three flushes of flowers, uh, which is great. And the bees love it. It's, um, it's a really, really, really good one for the bees. Um, and again, like I said, one of the most uncurlable plants I've ever worked with. Uh, next type of lily is, is the oriental lily. So before I showed you the Asiatic lilies that flower much earlier, the oriental lilies don't tend to flower here until kind of mid-August, I would say. These get much taller. So um, sorry, oriental lilies can get up to like five, six feet tall. Sometimes they do need staking when they get that tall. Uh, there's two different varieties here. You'll see the one, the white one on the left has no stamens or pollen. It's like a double lily. And the one on the other side is like a kind of more common lily with the, the stamens in it. Now these are heavily scented. These smell amazing. Um, I find if you cut one of these and put it in your house, your whole house will smell like a lily within five minutes. Um, really, really hardy too. So if you plant um, one bulb within a couple of years, you're going to have several of these lily stems coming up. Um, because they do get quite tall, they're really nice things to maybe put a little bit further back in the garden so that maybe some of the foliage is hidden and you just get these really bright sunny faces um, popping out when they flower. So that's oriental. The next one's a martagon lilies. Now martagon lilies are still fairly unheard of, but they're definitely kind of making themselves known on social media a little more and like a lot of floor designers are kind of using these guys they're a little bit more unusual the flowers are much smaller so each flowers are maybe i don't know this big they're much smaller than the other regular lilies but they have a much more dainty unique quality uh, i'm not exactly sure where they're native from but they do really really well here and they do really well in the shade so there's not that many of those really big kind of bright lilies that love to be in the shade. These guys absolutely thrive in the shade. So there's a close-up of one here. And then the other photo is, um, I want to say I put, we put about 15 bulbs in this garden bed maybe six or seven years ago. And now I don't even know how many stems I have from those guys. And they're like kind of a mid-summer flower. And because they're like, it's a really great way to... Um, bright enough a shady area in the garden. Um, they do take a couple of years to really take off and multiply, but I think um, if you have patience, it's absolutely worth it. And they're a bit unusual too. I get um, a lot of people stop and ask questions about these guys. They have a little bit of a funny smell though, just heads up. Um, so bee balm, also called manada. This is a clump forming perennial. I think they kind of look like fireworks a little bit. They're really cool. They smell like bergamot. They smell like Earl Grey, which is nice. The pollinators love them. Very cold hardy. They come in a bunch of different colors, like white, pink, red, purples, everything in between. Uh, and there's different varieties. So you can get small little stunted varieties that won't exceed more than one and a half feet tall. And then you get the more standard varieties that probably get around five feet tall and they're clump forming. So every year the clump gets bigger and bigger. So if you're wanting to fill in an area, they're a really great plant to fill in an area. They do have creeping stolen. So um, they do tend to spread a little bit, but uh, I kind of like spring plants because you can always dig them up and give them to your friends and make more plants and spread them around. Um, so yeah, and these also do well in full sun up to part shade as well. Um, so again, some more summer blues. Uh, we have Crocosmia here, which um, I had a question that came in about Crocosmia. So they grow from little corms. You can plant them in the spring and they perennialize and every year the clump gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, they come in a few different colors. They make a really wonderful cut flower. They'll last in the vase for a long time. Even after the flowers have all died back, they leave these really interesting seed pods on the plant. So it's like an extended interest um, in the garden. They do once after a couple of years when the clump gets quite big, uh, sometimes they can flop over. So they do require staking if you're not a fan of them being flopped over. Um, but these are 
yeah, they're really kind of nice striking addition. And then on the other side here, we have yarrow. And yarrow, again, is really, really common. And I think a lot of people kind of take it for granted. I, I popped it up, but yarrow usually comes in white or yellow, but um, it does come in pretty much nearly every color. Um, it's becoming more and more popular. It's native, the pollinators mm -hmm. love it. It's really, really drought tolerant. So if you have dry, non-irrigated areas in your garden, it'll do well. Um, comes back really strong. It makes an excellent cut flower. They, they, they last for a really, really long time in an arrangement. And um, yeah, I think I kind of put it up there because um, I think it gets a bad rap as being taken for granted, but I think uh, it takes a bit more time to appreciate how pretty it is and that it comes in all these wonderful colors that you don't really see too often, uh, but still totally available. So now I'll be kind of moving into the more late summer blooming. So we have the sedum on this side. So sedum, sorry, this photo isn't that great. Um, is it, it's actually, it's a type of succulent, but they do really, really well in our cold weather. They do like full sun. These guys are one of the last things that bloom in the garden. So they'll start blooming kind of in the late summer and they'll hold their pink blooms right up until there's a harsh frost. So they do, they're like a real powerhouse um, in the garden. They usually in the fall when everything else has kind of died back and starting to look mushy, these sedums are still looking really happy. Um, bees love them as well. They're also excellent cut flower. And on the other side here, we have the phlox. Um, there's a couple of different types of phlox. Um, a lot of people use phlox as an annual. The perennial phlox can get quite tall. Um, since these ones I have in my garden are about four and a half, five feet tall. Um, really, really great to kind of put somewhere in like the back of a garden bed. So, um, you know, like maybe spring, summer, you have some other things showing some interest in the front. And then in the winter, you have this whole wash of color that comes up in the back. And again, these come in every color imaginable. They do tend to spread. So every couple of years, you may want to pull some of the stems out or divide them up, give them to your friends. Um, I'm obviously a fan of these perennials that you can just kind of keep producing more and more plants off. So it's really great. Uh, again, late summer, we have Echinacea and Rebecca. So really kind of common in Whistler. The purple Echinacea is what you kind of see most of the time. That kind of orangey pinky one in the middle is a fairly, it's not a newer variety, but it's starting to get a bit more popular. So I think people always think of the, I want to say boring old purple echinacea, because it's not, it's beautiful, but there are other echinaceas out there that might be a little bit more interesting if you're sick of seeing the same old purple. So these don't flower until fairly late in the season. And then same thing with the Rebecca or the Black Eyed Susans. Um, they actually also come in a couple of different colors as well. And these ones, well, you can't tell from the photo, but they're small. Um, there's like little mini ones, which are kind of a little bit cuter than like the regular standard ones that we see. And again, these guys will flower right up until there's been a couple of frosts before they before they cack out for the season. But um, yeah, also the Rebecca too, they they tend to, to spread, which is great if you have um, spaces to fill in. Now for some other late season ones, there's the Japanese anemone, so, or anemone humphanesia, the little purple anemone I showed you earlier, same family, but that one flowers much earlier in the season, and these ones flower much later in the season. So they're a nice clump forming perennial. They do really well in the shade. They actually don't really like a whole lot of full sun. And they have these really, really delicate, beautiful flowers that also last really, really well in a vase. The plant will get bigger and bigger over the year, but it won't spread like some of these other perennials will. And then the other guy on the other side is called Actea or Semisophiga or bug beans as well. And these flower really late in the season. So these will be flowering after pretty much everything else is done. Those little spires of tiny white flowers smell amazing. They smell like straight up honey. And at the end of the season, where all the flowers are done, the bees flock to this. It's kind of like one of their, their last food sources before they have to hibernate for the winter in their hives. Um, they get really tall. Um, the black foliage is a really beautiful contrast um, against other colors in the garden, especially in the fall if you have shrubs where the leaves are changing. So if you put this next to like a burning bush or a Japanese maple that's got bright orange leaves, this black foliage next to that is like such a striking combination. Um, and does really well in the Whistler area. Prefers a uh, part shade, it, uh, it's a bit delicate in the full sun. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a really great one to look out for. And okay, so I had a question that came in about ground covers for shady areas. And so I just listed kind of like my most kind of tried and true uh, ground covers for shady areas. So I just run through them really quickly. So at the top, we have one called Juga, which is sometimes called bugle weed that will grow in sun and shade and late spring gets these little purple flowers on it. It has a creeping tendency. So when you try to cover big swaths of ground 
um, it can fairly quickly cover it. The bottom corner, we have the ladies mantle, which um, mostly is normally grown as a sun plant, but I find just absolutely well in the shade. This does freely self seed. Um, so just watch out for that if you're trying to contain it. Um, but it's conforming, it's these little yellow flowers, which are quite pretty. In the middle, we have gallium, which I think is also called sweet woodruff. That um, is a darling of the shade and it gets those little white flowers um, late spring. Um, then on the top corner, we have a sarum, which is actually native ginger. Um, the roots have, the roots smell gin, like ginger and they're beautiful and it has these kind of glossy waxy leaves. Um, again, like wonderful brown creeping for um, shady areas. And then the bottom corner, we have creeping jenny and creeping jenny is, uh, can go in full sun all the way up to fairly dense shade. Creeping jenny, you often see it in hanging baskets. It's like a little kind of spindly things that hangs down in hanging baskets. So it is kind of like a viney creeper, but on the ground, it actually forms a really dense mat. Um, it comes in either lime green or a bright yellow. I love to use the bright yellow one in shady areas because it really darkens up um, a gloomy space. And then hostas and ferns are also can be mass planted to create um, shade ground cover. Uh, I also had a question that somebody had written in about growing moss and um, someone that was wanting to intentionally grow and spread moss into some surfaces. Um, so if you just go into a forest or don't take moss from the forest, but if you had a mossy part in your, your garden and you scooped up some moss and tried to replant it somewhere else, chances are it's not going to take. It um, just will probably dry out. So I've tried it so many times, it never works. Um, what you can do, which I haven't actually done this myself before, but I worked with a landscape architect a couple of years ago who did this successfully, was um, making a slurry out of moss. So if you get some existing moss and you put it in a blender with some water and buttermilk, and the reason you use buttermilk is because uh, it has vinegar in it and they like the acidity and then something about some sugars in the dairy help it. All right, but if you mix um, moss and buttermilk together into like a gross paste, and then you paint that onto the surfaces that we believe the moss to grow. Um, it has a much better chance of taking, especially on a porous surface. So um, if it's like a, like a woody surface, something that's porous and it can kind of cling into, um, so you could give that a try. I haven't tried it myself, but um, I've seen it done. It looks pretty cool. Oh. Um, then, so I had a question that came in about more structural plants in the garden. So something, you know, because we talked about all these other beautiful um, perennials, which tend to be a little bit smaller, things like that. So these are some of my favorite shrubs um, to put in the garden. So the, the smoke bush at the top is this beautiful dark foliage leaf, which contrasts beautifully with all sorts of other things around it. The hydrangea at the bottom. So there's all different types of hydrangeas. Um, there's a family of hydrangea called paniculata, which always flower on new wood. So the um, pruning for them is very, very easy. The flowers last, um, they'll, they'll flower late in the fall and they last a really long time. The flowers always kind of start off white and then fade to antique pink the longer they've been on there. And um, other, the question was also structural plants that won't get mushed by snow. So when I was with all the heavy snow load, these are all plants that can kind of take a beating. So the smoke bush always kind of has like a bit of a, squirrely growth pattern anyway. They're meant to be kind of a bit of a wild look. Uh, the hydrangea paniculata, because they always flower on new wood, if all their stems get smushed in the snow, it doesn't matter because you cut them off in the spring anyway and they'll grow onto new stems. So all of my hydrangeas right now, I haven't had a chance to start pruning them yet. I need to get to it soon. But right now they all look fairly um, collapsed and that's fine. I'm gonna cut all the collapsed bits off, bits off and then they're gonna, it's gonna look like this again at the end of the season. Uh, the one in the middle that's called giant fleece, um, it's a persicarius, and that's not a shrub, it's actually a perennial, and it's one of the largest growing perennials, it gets about 15 feet tall, so in the spring you can actually like watch it growing every day, the, um, the shoots kind of look very similar to bamboo, and then they get these flowers on them a bit later in the season, so whilst it's not a shrub, they grow into huge plants that can take up a lot of space in the garden and provide like a backdrop to other plants, and because it's a perennial that dies back completely at the end of the year, it's not going to get smushed by snow. Uh, top corner, we have lilacs. They are they can really, really take a beating. Plus, they have the beautiful flowers that everyone loves. Um, they do really well in this stuff. And then the bottom one is a burning bush, which um, most of the summer just looks green. But in the fall, they have um, this beautiful color change. And um, I have quite a few burning bushes, and um, they've even survived this year's crazy snow dump. So they're 
they have quite flexible branches. So I think uh, when all the snow is falling on them, they bend rather than snap. So like some of the ones I have right now, they're looking a little sad, but they're going to perk back up. I'm sure of it. Um, and that's it for, um, for what I have for there. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Um, I'm just going to hit the lights. So we can see each other in here. Um, folks at home, we have plenty of time for questions, but I am going to ask the last. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if you had one in mind, but I picked the dark green question. Oh, go for it. So the answer was revealed by Claire. Remember, hand up if you know the answer. What climate zone is Whistler in? Ooh, right there. Five. Five. That's right, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Good listening, everybody. Or maybe you already knew that. I did not before tonight. Um, okay, so we have lots of time for questions. Um, folks on Zoom, we oh, sorry, I keep looking at my my computer uh video, but you're actually over there. Hi. Um you can ask questions through the chat, or you can put a hand up if you'd like to say your question out loud. We will be able to hear you here in the room. And we can also take questions here. Anybody want to jump in right over here? Yeah, um, I have a helicopter that's just got big enough to split, I think, but I've never split them before. Can you just take it and just pack them enough after the You can. Yeah. You absolutely can. You can just like cut it right down the middle. Um, I feel like hellebores are a little bit special. Like they, they, they can take it, like it's not going to yeah. harm it. But if you want it to maybe bounce back quicker or nicer, I would, um, if, if you have tines or like two like two pitchforks and you kind of pitchfork it in the middle and like shimmy it. Yeah. yeah. So I, you could, you could absolutely just chop it. And um, I think I do a lot of that because I deal with so many plants that I don't have the time to really be finicky and really pull them apart properly all the time. Um, but it would it would bounce back after being split easily, being being cut for, for sure. They're they're strong. I wouldn't do it now. I would do it in the fall for hellebore because it's just flowering right now. Yeah, yeah. I would do it in the fall once it's um once it's kind of died back. A bit. Okay, we had one more in the room, and then we have one on Zoom. If there was, yeah, go ahead. I uh, just advice on squirrels and bulbs. I'm trying to get bulbs established, and they have to keep them. Right, so um, the only thing that I found really, really works is putting like chicken wire down. So like planting, like planting the bed and then putting chicken wire over the soil. And once the bulbs are maybe this tall in the spring, lifting it off. So um, depending on how you're planting them in your garden, that's not always practical. I know um, some people are doing like pots or raised beds and put the, the chicken wire over that. If you're trying to like have them sporadically placed through the garden, that's kind of not really so much of an option. Um, yeah, that's it's kind of a it's kind of a, a tricky one. Um, if they tulips, you can plant tulips up into like a full foot deep. So if you have a foot of workable soil, you could try and put the bulb really deep. Um, so maybe a little squirrel can't get that far. Um, I was going to try starting them in a pot and then transplant them really uh, to, to, for, like, to force them. Uh, well, just so that they can, I don't know if the squirrels will eat them after they start to bloom. I, I find not. Like, I find most of the squirrel, to happen, squirrel damage happens not long after the fall when you plant them and throughout like the winter under the snow. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've, I find like once they're, once they're growing, once they're up, um, I feel like by then there's other squirrel food around and they leave them alone. But yeah, you could definitely try putting planting um, bulbs in pots with chicken wire and then just like planting that pot completely into the ground as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to repeat the question. <laughs> sorry, Zoom folks. So you probably figured out that that question was about squirrels <laughs> and uh, bulbs, um, but I will repeat any others that, that come up. Um, Ginny, I see you have your hand up. Do you want to unmute yourself to ask your question? You can go ahead if you'd like to. Yes. Hi. Um, I am going to build a raised bed and I want to know uh, what's the, I don't have any specific plants I want to put in it. So I know this is a vague question, but what's the minimum depth I can get away with or, or, you know, what's the ideal depth of, for soil in a raised bed? 
Yeah, so you can definitely get away with like a foot of soil or a bit less than a foot of soil if you're not planting shrubs. If you're just planting shrubs or things with like um like a woody system, I would go a little deeper. If you're planting like annuals, like like a veggie garden that's going to be annuals or annual flowers, you can even get away with like six inches sometimes that you don't really need a lot for perennials and things that are going to stay in the ground for more than a year I would say a, a foot a foot is good yeah thank you yeah thanks Ginny um I also have another question in the chat here which is can you repeat the name of the shade grass you mentioned earlier in your talk yeah so it's um it's a Japanese one it's our, it's the full Latin I can never pronounce but it's um the abbreviation is Hakon, H-A-K-O-N-E, Hakon, and then the, the other part of it is, um, it's long. I love it. It's, um, it, it spreads well. It's beautiful. Hakon grass. Would you say Japanese shade grass? It's, um, I'm going to try and say it. Hakon Shalona. The abbreviation is is Hakon, so H A K O N E, H A K O N E, and then if you look that, you'll get the full the full name for it, and um and it's 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 a really really nice shade cover, um and it's yeah this beautiful bright bright grass that um it's really great under like under trees and canopies where it kind of gets like dark shady corners really brightens it up a lot and um in the fall like I don't cut it back in the fall um in the fall even after frost it still looks green and it looks really nice it's not until the spring after the snow melts it looks like dead grass then you you rake it up in the spring and then it kind of comes back again it's a little bit slow to come back in the spring you know I feel like every year I have these these big clumps of it and it, it's getting to like June and it still looks kind of crappy. It just takes a little longer. Yeah, that's worth it. Over here. Um, I'm wondering about a recommendation for a really hardy ground cover for uh, drought resistance, like for a really sunny area that doesn't get a lot of water. So, so oh, sorry, Claire. So that was a really hardy ground cover for drought resistance in a really uh, sunny, dry area. Yeah. Um. So creeping Jenny does really well. And it's like, it's again, that's the one you often see in hanging baskets, like the kind of like stringy bits that when you plant that on the ground, it forms a mat and it actually can form quite a dense mat. So it actually helps hold moisture in after a while when it's established and it doesn't need much water to thrive. Um, it can kind of take a couple of years for it to take off. So um, if you went to the nursery and bought like a couple like little forage pots and planted them a few inches apart within the season, they will have um, filled in for each other. Um, another a nice drought tolerant one would be the ajuga, also called bugleweed. Um, that can that's like sun all the way to shade. It's a really really versatile plant. It's really hard. You get little purple flowers in the late spring, and um, the foliage is a really dark purple, sometimes almost blackish looking foliage. And it's a shiny leaf, and the the creeping jenny and that together is like a really striking contrast, which is really cool. Um, yeah, mm, that was bugle. Bugleweed. Bugleweed. Yeah. Mm. In case anybody's frantically taking notes at home, you're all going to get this recording, so and you will be able to. The <laughs> Ajuda Bugle, which I was just talking about, is that top corner. Oh, so that one right there. This yeah. one right here, top left. Yeah, so That's even though these are saying ground covers for shade, they'll also absolutely do, like the, the Ajuda and the Creeping Jenny will also do the sun. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I have another question here on Zoom. Uh, any suggestions for plants to grow under Western cedars? Oh, yes. Sorry, that was a question that came through. I, uh... okay. So again, the creeping jenny is going to do really well under the cedar. Um, down at Brew Creek, we have lots of really huge cedars. And I have one that is completely surrounded by this creeping jenny. It seems to love it there. Um, some ferns do really well. So cedars provide a really acidic soil environment around their bases. So any plants that can do shade and acidic will do well. So depending on how big your cedar is and what your, how much canopy, um, azaleas and rhododendrons will do okay underneath a cedar. So long as you have workable soil underneath it. Um, cedar trees can be tricky because their root system is really, really shallow on the surface. And they're kind of like tiny little roots can make like it's almost like sponges in the um, in the understory of the the soil. So if it's like a if it's like a big huge like forest cedar that you have, you can probably you can like get a sharp shovel and you can dig hunks of this like sponge root system out, and it's not going to harm the tree. And then you can put your 
other small like shrubs like ferns or, um, ferns or shrubs or whatever plants you're putting into that hole. If it's a younger, smaller cedar, obviously you don't want to damage the root system that much. So then I would use something more shallow rooted like that creeping jenny. Um, ferns are a good option. Um, and if you think of any other ones, let me know because I have lots of cedars and that kind of that's what I have around mine. <laughs> Um, somebody on Zoom is wondering, same thing for under spruce or a bit different? Oh, you know, a spruce, I'm not too sure. I actually down Free Creek, I don't have any spruce trees down there. Um, so I, I can't confidently give you an answer on that one. Sorry. I have a question with tree breakage. Mm -hmm. um, how to handle it, it has to work cleanly. Have to break on that year, maybe with a season that kind of. It's like torn. Torn, yeah. Yeah. Mm. So, um, sorry, I'll, I'll repeat that just <laughs> just for the folks at home. Um, this is about tree breakage. So, what happens when you have a break that is not uh, a clean break with a torn branch? Go ahead. Yeah. So, the when it if it broke during the winter, it um it would have like it's 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 going like it's dumb, right? So that where it's broken, it's not going to actively grow. So you have to cut that limb mm -hmm. off. Mm -hmm. If the break is, if you catch it when it's a really fresh split, mm -hmm. there's always a chance of trying to stick it back together. It's called like frog tape, where you can kind of squeeze the branches and wrap it up, and mm -hmm. it kind of heals itself. Doesn't always work, but um, you need to get it when it's fresh. If it happened in the winter and now it's dried out, that's that's not going to come back together. So you'll need to cut it off um, with a saw. So if um if it's if it's torn and you have like this tear going down this way, grab your saw from the underside and cut it from this side. Because if you cut from this side, you're going to maybe increase the tear. So go from underneath up. And if it's a larger branch too, I would always um further down the branch, cut a bunch of it off so the weight comes off it. Mm -hmm. So that when you're doing your more kind of delicate work right next to the trunk, you're not trying to maneuver this big branch flopping around while you're okay. down. And you don't have to treat the, the open wound? Um, if it happened in the winter, like it's probably like it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's dried up, mm -hmm. it's done. If it was new and gooey, um, I was actually talking to a, um, another landscaper colleague this week because I have my ornamental trees took a painting this year and I have some maples that have almost like split down the middle. And um, he was actually saying that in his past, he rubs dirt on the wound. Oh. Yeah, and something about uh, introducing some of that like um, mycology from, from the soil system um, back into the tree. So if you pick up a piece of dirt from where, like mm -hmm. at the base of the tree, you know, those roots have a symbiotic relationship with the mycology in the soil, putting that on the wound. Um, and I haven't done it myself, but um, I don't think it would hurt. Another question from Zoom, any idea of how to best manage, in scare quotes, bamboo in a garden, uh, which was already there when I moved in? Um, <laughs> for the pickaxe and a shovel, um, bamboo is considered invasive. So bamboo is invasive. It's obviously not native. So uh, bamboo is, you know, taking away environment from natural, um, uh, natural plants. Um, no, it's hard and like the, the root system is tough. Like it's gonna be some uh, some elbow grease for sure. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't, yeah. And cause bamboo too, like it's um, like other like organic ways of trying to like kill off invasive plants. Like um, in the spring, like covering it with a dark silage tan so it gets no sunlight, right? So cause plants have the photosynthesis to survive. Um, bamboo grows straight through, it doesn't work. So. Um, yeah, bamboo is um, really, really closely related to Japanese knotweed as well, mm. which is whilst it's a completely different plant, they're related and that's considered one of the most invasive species in the Cedar Skull Corridor with the most threat to our ecosystem right now. So um, yeah, I'm really sorry that you had to inherit bamboo, hopefully, yeah, get digging. <laughs> Godspeed. Uh, <laughs> Anybody else in the room? Oh, I have like these random packets of like mixed and I tried to do it like for them and it didn't really do well or something which was wildflowers yeah so this is a question about mixed wildflowers and results so there is um there's this really romantic idea about throwing down a packet of wild seeds yeah. wildflower <laughs> seeds and it coming up as this beautiful meadow that it looks like on the packet <laughs> so that, that, that's a, it's a fantasy yeah. it, it is so when you see a packet of wildflower seeds and it's all in flowers so it's always a mix of seeds right so there's usually a mix of annuals and perennials and spring summer fall bloomers all in that pack 
The photo on the pack is all of them flowering at once. Mm -hmm. In reality, they're never all going to flower at once. Um, also, to like they they are seeds, so they still need to kind of be taken care of a little bit if you really want to culture it to look as beautiful as it can. So I would rather just throwing them on the ground. I, I would prep the ground. So get a hard rake or something and kind of rake up the top inch or so of soil so that the soil is um, broke, like broken up and a bit chunky so that all those seeds have somewhere to fall into. Um, if we just throw a pack of seeds onto some compacted soil, the first time it rains, we're just going to wash away, right? Or the birds are going to pack them all out before they have a chance to germinate. So create an environment where they can actually have a chance of germinating. If there's already other established weeds or plants growing in there, especially weeds, take them out because those other plants are going to outcompete those delicate little flowers that are starting to get going. Um, and then also you keep them moist for the first little bit. So, you know, just like roadside where people throw them, like for every one wildflower that's come up, there's probably a hundred seeds that didn't even germinate. So put down more than you think you need, prep the side a little bit and keep it watered a little bit until they've germinated or until they're a little, a, like little plants, right? So it's like, those like plastic trays oh to, to germinate them and then plant yeah. out yeah i mean that's definitely like more effort but that would give them a much better chance at survival but when you see um you know people thinking that they want to just like this whole um you know bit on the side of the road where they're going to put the wild seeds like it's you, you can do it you just need way more seeds than you think you're going to need and give the soil like some agitation first before you put them down oh and a tickle I I've got some lavash seeds from you guys. Oh, nice. I, I, plant, I tried to plant so many and nothing's sprouted at all. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if I did something wrong. Lavish, uh, we'll bring you some lavish. I'll, I'll pop some lavish down to take it for you because we have <laughs> we, we have tons of it. And it's a really hardy plant as well. And uh, so for those who know, lavish is a herb. It, um, the leaves taste like celery. So like the young leaves taste like celery. And when the plants mature and get older, the stems are hollow. And down at Free Creek, we actually use them as straws in our seasons because it's like a celery flavored straw. They're really cool. And the plants are really hardy and they, they get quite quite large, but um, I'm going to bring Sanka some lovage. <laughs> um, <coughs> sorry, somebody's asking, what's the plant? Oh, it's called lovage. Lovage. It, like L-O-V-A-G-E. Yeah. yeah, a good way to remember it is the song, I want to know what love is. <laughs> <laughs> love that. Love it. Um, I feel like those wildflower packs were the wedding favor. Like, oh, yeah. plant these and watch our love grow. <laughs> uh -oh. Yeah. <laughs> Um, is there another question? Any remedies for a horsetail? I never know, like, I'm reading all these. You must have some up there. Yeah, this yeah, question I'm was. I'm trying to figure out if you split them out or if I cut them and select them. Remedies so, for like, horsetail. So, horsetail, it's native when it's growing in the forest, it's actually really nice, but it is really invasive in our gardens. Um, just one. Fun fact about horsetail, which might help you feel better about yep. having such a hard time getting rid of it. It's actually classed as a living fossil, which means that <laughs> horsetail has not changed its genome. It hasn't evolved. It hasn't changed since before the dinosaurs were on the planet. So the plant is so successful at living that it's going to outlive all of us. Um, it's been through ice ages, it's been through everything, and like the, the DNA hasn't changed, it hasn't evolved. It, it grows in deserts, it grows in clay, it grows in water, it grows in darkness, it grows, it grows everywhere. So it's um, it's vein of our existence in gardens, it's one of the worst things to try and deal with. Um, and it every time there's like the plant has like little nodes, and if you rip those nodes apart, they each put like gonna create a new plant. So when you're pulling it up, unless you kind of get the whole root structure, any roots left in the soil are just going to, and they, they tunnel, they, they go horizontal, they go down, they go everywhere. Um, I've made messes of gardens before, like trying to get it. And when you really tunnel down far and you get it, it slows it down, but it's still going to come back. Um, I, uh, I had a... Snip, snipping it, it's going to come back quicker, but then it's a lot less effort than actually trying to weed it out. So mm -hmm. I um, I had a, a client once several years ago that had a lot of horsetail on the property and um, there was realistically, it was always, you had to manage it. Like you can't get rid of it. You have to manage it. And um, the expectation was unrealistic as to what we could do with a horsetail. So 
I wrote a small essay about it being a living fossil and how it's basically, um, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, you have it in your garden. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, so a couple of questions. So I have a situation where creeping Jen is done quite well and it's underneath dogwood and the dogwood so well, it's really scraggly. Um, so is there anything I can plant again because the creeping Jenny won't take? Like so sorry, let me let me repeat that. So there's creeping Jenny doing very well under a dogwood that is not doing well. Am I correct in that? So what could she plant that will well the dogwood tries to come back? Mm. Sort of what's a good mix there? What's a good mix? Do you the know dogwood? um what kind of dogwood it is? It was there No, is it is it like was it large? Like how um, um it's just kind of scraping and they keep saying I'm sure it'll come back every year and it right because um you could it, it does the creeping journey come right up to the base of the plant yeah, yeah you could like rip it away right because give it space yeah like you know kind of like if like the stem's growing out kind of like just pull the creeping jenny back like like rip it out and make a, a bit of a circle around it add a little compost to the bottom to help feed the the dogwood um i would say because i've got quite a bit of creeping jenny um i i love it and I think you know, whenever it starts encroaching on things, I just I just kind of rip at it. But um, as an alternative to a dogwood, as a shrub would be a hydrangea. Uh, anything that's sort of mid-range. Like right now it's got the bright yellow and green leaves and then a kind of a, a little bit of red because it's not. So I'm just wondering if I pop the color and then the shrub. Um, so hydra um, another nice shrub that would work is um, spirea. And spirea, there's a whole bunch of different types of spireas. There's there's a few that are native um, to here, but even the ones that aren't native, they're all really similar. And so spirea, sometimes there's um, the the leaf color ranges anywhere from bright yellow to dark green. They they flower, which is really nice. You can get white or pink flowers on spirea, and they're pretty. Like they're really really tough. They're they're usually a little bit bushier than a dogwood. Like um, a dogwood has um, like less branches and slightly bigger leaves. This variety is like a little bit more clustered. Um, and again, they can, you can buy dwarf varieties that kind of won't get more than two or three feet tall. And some um, spireas can end up growing into big full-size bushes. But that might be a nice one to look at. You tried. <laughs> yeah. uh, folks on Zoom, any other questions from you? Go ahead, Beth. Um, I've got this bearded iris, and um, the snow's just melted away, and I can see the bearded iris that I planted last year, and it's looking very mushy. Mushy? <laughs> yeah. Like the foliage? Yeah, and I can see the top of the... Yeah, it's like a rhizome? Yeah, yeah. underneath the... Well, that was sitting underneath the soil, but it's just kind of come up. Yeah. And it's looking super mushy. Is it salvageable? So like is the 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 rhizome itself mushy or just the foliage? I think it's mostly the foliage. I haven't taken a close look at the rhizome, but it looked a bit mushy from a distance. So the, the rhizome itself, the fact that it's sitting out of the soil a little bit is totally fine. There's lots of um gardeners that actually have this technique of have of having the rhizome raised. They think it gets like a bigger and better flowers if the rhizomes further sunk in the soil, they tend to not flower as well. So mm. like the rhizome exposed, is exposed, it's totally fine. Did you, in the fall, did you cut the foliage off in the fall? Uh, yes. All the way down or did you leave some? Maybe a bit of it. Is a, is, and is that the foliage that's mushy? Sure, yeah. That's fine, that's dead, it's gonna rot away and you will grow back. Right. So yeah, if it's like, cause it wouldn't like now, so like I've seen irises around town that are growing their new foliage, but some of them haven't started growing their new foliage yet. Yeah. And even if they grew new foliage, and it got too cold or someone stepped on it or something, it's gonna grow back. Like they're they're pretty tough. Okay. They're pretty tough. I would just say like it's like it's still so early in the season. Just give it, okay. give it a few more okay. weeks. Thank yeah. <laughs> yeah. All is not lost. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, what are like peonies? Um, you know they go like mushy like in the fall and stuff. Do you have to like cut them back at a particular time or can you just leave it or? Yeah, I, I usually cut them back once um once they start to naturally die back. Okay. So once they start turning brown and flopping, that's when I cut them back. Okay. Um, I say that for a, a lot of perennials, it's nice to 
cut the foliage back and leave it in place um, over the winter as kind of like a natural mold. I don't do that with peonies because peonies are really susceptible to mold and rot. Okay. So I usually take their foliage off and remove it. Okay. Yeah. But, if, but if you don't, if you left it on and you have to cut it back in the spring, it's fine too. Oh, okay. yeah. This is also a plug for um, a talk that Claire did in the fall that I can send you the link to about fall gardening. Yeah, so, and there's um, peonies in that too, I believe. Yeah. So yeah. I'll send that link out when I send the link to this one out. Um, I know the fall is a ways away, <laughs> but just in case you're curious, and maybe who knows, maybe we'll have Claire back in the fall. Yeah, I'd love to come back. <laughs> um, anybody else in the room in the Zoom? Oh, that's cool. Go ahead. I have a glass panel uh, railing around a deck. Okay. Any sort of plant life I can create privacy. Is it very sunny? Very sunny. Very, very sunny. Yeah, so I guess on the deck, so you'll be growing in pots right. on the deck. So something that's going to be easy to grow in a pot and take full sun that will grow privacy. So a couple options is um, if you wanted something very low maintenance is um, you, you shrubs or like uh, taxis of personality or you, they're like a native shrub. They have really, really dense dark green foliage. Okay. Um, and that's something that you can put in a pot there pretty low maintenance, you won't have to water it very often. You can buy different sizes. Obviously the larger the shrub, it's gonna be a little bit more expensive to buy from the garden center. But again, they're native and a beautiful, nice dark green foliage um, that would definitely screen for privacy. Another option would be an annual that you could grow up on a trellis like scarlet runner beans or sweet peas or something like that. So if you could have pots on your deck with um, like a trellis structure and that could just be like bamboo and twine or you could buy like a fancy metal one from the garden center. But scarlet runner beans, you could pop them in and they, they could potentially grow up to like a 12 foot screen within, within a month. And then that, because it's an annual in the fall, it's gonna die back. And so then you're gonna get your sunshine in the winter coming through and then it's gonna create a dark blush screen to so, um, shade and privacy in the summertime. Hmm. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that's a couple options. We have another question here. Any shade loving perennial grasses? Um, that, Hackerin grass mm, is Japanese a shade loving one. perennial grass. Mm -hmm. um, I find millet grass does okay. Not, I'd say part shade. I don't know if it does well in super deep shade, but part shade millet grass does pretty well. Um, otherwise than that, not usually like grass by its very nature is more of a sunny, sunny, um, sunny plant. But um, trying to think of something that could potentially look grassy. Um, for the shade. Yeah. Um, if you haven't heard of a cinnamon fern, I would potentially look up cinnamon ferns. Um, they they don't look anything like a regular like Western sword fern that you normally see in the forest. They're a pale green, they're kind of quite tall and upright. Um, that might be a good option too to have a look at that. Ooh. So if we see anybody with that Japanese grass in their yard this year, we're going to know they were either here or listening. <laughs> okay, my friends. Well, it's it's just about that time to wrap up. Um, before we before I let you all go, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that um, we do have a seed library here at the library. Uh, it's in partnership with Aware, so they help us sort of maintain it. Um, and it's not just for vegetables. It, you can put flower seeds in there as well. You can put any, any sort of seeds, um, as long as you can tell us what they are. <laughs> um, there's all the gear in the box out there to put to label um, envelopes and to um, distribute them through multiple multiple envelopes if you want to share the love. Um, and of course, you can borrow for it. So um, yeah, there's, there's, it's slowly growing, but it really relies on the community. Um, bringing things, donating seeds to the library um, to, to make it as diverse as possible. So uh, the next time you're in, you can have a look. There's also a gardening book display out there. Um, so check it out next time you're in. Um, any last questions on Zoom or in person? Thank you so much. Thanks, Claire. Thank you. And thank you to everybody who is at home. I'm going to stop the recording now.